In the past, I've tried including this chapter at the beginning of the semester. We will review it next semester. It is hard to write a research proposal without having been exposed to the previous 23 chapters. Of course, it is impossible to write a research report without having first done most of the stuff in the previous 23 chapters. So this chapter really should be covered at both the beginning and the end of the semester, making it truly the alpha and the omega of chapters. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the final letter of the Greek alphabet. Both are terms used in statistics, which is the train coming down the tracks for the next semester. The light at the end of the tunnel could be an exit or an oncoming train. Either way, your long walk in the dark will soon end. Just a little philosophy, folks. Chapter 24 is all about going into action. Hopefully, over the course of the semester, you've come to realize that there is value to the social work profession to be rigorously engaged with research. If for another reason, then hopefully you've come to understand that being able to operate in a world governed by evidence-based practices and the ability to demonstrate that you are that your individual practice is effective is going to be part of our very near future. Currently, there are a lot of organizations and institutions out there that rely on grants and other types of fundings that are increasingly demanding that we as social workers provide compelling evidence that our interventions are in fact effective. In chapter 24 we learn about writing research proposals, something that you will do in the next semester's research class. You may have to do a research proposal in your program evaluation class and or in your integration seminar class. Finding a funding source might seem like it's a long ways off. However, I was just speaking with one of our graduates several weeks ago, and even though Mark had just graduated in the past two or three years, he was in a significant leadership role <clears throat> in a long established, well respected local nonprofit social services agency and he was writing grants left and right. And he expressed his gratitude for the emphasis we put on research and evaluation in our advanced generalist program here at UMKC. We will go over the difference between grants and contracts today, talk a little bit about some things you should be thinking about before you ever get to the proposal writing stage the various components of a research proposal and some unique things about qualitative research proposals. And finally we will talk about writing research reports, both quantitative and qualitative. Like everything else in research, Writing a research proposal takes more time than what you might think. When you get into practice and you are in that leadership position or administrative position and a request for proposals or RFP comes across your desk along with a memo from your employer saying, let's go for this, you will want to be prepared for it. When I was sitting on a committee of the local small not-for-profit that was attempting to find money, I was often frustrated by the way this organization did business. <clears throat> when I sat down and looked at the proposals that they would want us to do some work on, more often than not I would discover that they had waited until too close to the submission deadline to be able to realistically submit the proposal. A second mistake that I saw them invariably make 
A second mistake that I saw them invariably make was trying to make the organization appear to fit the guidelines and the purposes of the funding resource when they did not in fact meet it. There would be other times when they would succumb to the, oh, we can do that trap. What I mean by that would be an RFP would come up outside the bounds of what the agency actually did, but it would be something that they somehow believed they could pull together a program and get the grant to fund it. It just doesn't work that way. Usually you get funds that enable you to build on things that you are already doing. It's much easier to get funding when you have a track record of doing something that the funder is interested in or you have a track record of doing something closely related to what the funder is interested in and you can easily or readily adapt to the funding priorities of the granting uh, source. So for example, if you are operating a small substance abuse program and you want to participate in a study of smoking cessation, the program already has the infrastructure to deliver the smoking cessation program. With the simple addition of some training and perhaps personnel. However, if you run a small program that delivers nutritional security resources, i.e. a food pantry, it's going to be a bit of a stretch for you to bring your agent into line with the funder's needs. The difficulty isn't just the problems with not having persons available to deliver the program, but it also has to do with the lack of ability to create a decent research proposal or contract proposal or response to the RFP that contains all the detailed information that will secure you the funds. If you've been working in the field of substance abuse for quite a while and you're working out of an addiction model, it might be relatively easy for you to review the literature related to smoking cessation and harm reduction and come up with a program to add to your substance abuse treatment. However, if you are completely unfamiliar with that literature, it is going to be just that much more work. And remember, when the funders offer funds, they have already done they, their homework. They will know the state of the most current literature. And finally, one of the things that I would look for, look at, would be what was the funding source? That little group that I was involved with had the habit of looking at these large federal government proposals, the ones that had five or more zeros behind them, and they wanted to go for those. The first thing I would do would look at the estimated amount of time to complete the proposal which is usually a part of any large research proposal. Typically, I would see things like 40 or more hours are necessary to complete this proposal. If you are working for an established agency and that is your job, you lock yourself away for a week or two and focus on just that. If you're part of an interdisciplinary team or, as I was, affiliated with a group that was primarily volunteers, then finding the that time on top of your regular work schedule to devote that many hours becomes a significant barrier. Requests for proposals can be found on the internet. One example is the National Institutes of Health website www.nih.gov. Here you would find listings of federal funding opportunities. NIH also provides other helpful resources such as guidelines for grants. Another resource specifically designed for social work researchers is the Institute for the Advancement of Social Work Research. This organization provides a listserv which also includes research related information including requests for proposals. Their website also includes links to a wide range of federal agencies, foundations, and research organizations. When we are looking for funds, it is important for us to quickly identify if we are dealing with a grant or a contract. Research grants are often investigator-initiated 
meaning there is a general pool of money offered by a granting source, usually some federal institute or private foundation, that the researcher then submits a proposal to. On the other hand, a research contract is very specific. The funding source wants a specific job done. If you see that you have a request for a contract proposal in front of you and what they are looking for <coughs> something well within your agency, well within what your agency is already doing, then go for it. Otherwise, you will probably just be wasting your time and effort in submitting that kind of proposal. Staff liaisons at the funding source can help to gauge interest in the study and adjust the proposed research to better fit the funding source priorities. Some funding sources require a preliminary letter describing the research idea before contacting any staff members. Liaisons, if you can contact them at an earlier stage, can also help you write such a letter. Descriptions of previously funded projects may be available through funding sources, websites. Others may provide helpful tips. Collaboration with a more senior research who has an established track record is particularly helpful if you are a new and inexperienced researcher. Exact expectations regarding the proposal components is dictated by the funding source. The executive summary is something like an abstract in a journal article. It is a broad overview of what the research proposal contains. It should point out briefly and in general all the other elements of the research proposal. Like we've talked about earlier in this semester when crafting a research proposal, we must link a real-world problem or question to identifiable evidence. Review committees for these research proposals look for narrow and specific answers to narrow and specific questions. The methods by which one proposes to observe and analyze these problems must be grounded in good research methodology. And there's needs to be sufficient evidence to indicate that you as an investigator will be able to answer those particular questions. The literature review, nothing new here. <clears throat> However, if you submit one of those literature reviews that I don't like, you know the ones, the ones that look like an annotated bibliography, and there's little evidence to suggest that you fully comprehend them, and have digested the literature, the reviewer will stop right there and boom, that's all folks. No matter how good research plan you have, no matter how deep of access you have to a population, if they take one look at a poorly formatted or out-of-date literature review, all of your hard work will be rejected. Now, don't be frightened off by terms like conceptual framework. Just like the research proposal, take it piece by piece. What is the rationale for your research question? I.e., why is this research important? What is your hypothesis? If you are studying an intervention, what is your research hypothesis? By research hypothesis, we are talking about your dependent variable. How is that going to be changed by the intervention that you are proposing? Or perhaps your rationale is that you're doing an intervention that has worked well with population X, and now I want to study that with population Y and Z. Finally, your conceptual framework will have operational definitions for all of your variables. If your intervention is a well-articulated treatment manual, then you can provide that as an attachment to operationally defined your independent variable. If you are providing an intervention, define how you're going to measure the change. So don't just say that they are going to reduce their smoking. Say it is predicted they will reduce their consumption of cigarettes by so many cigarettes a day 
or they will have ceased smoking cigarettes by seven weeks of intervention. Be specific about what you mean by an outcome <clears throat> on any of your variables or any of your variables. If you are treating a condition that carries with it any kind of psychological diagnosis, include a copy of whatever instrument you are using to assess that condition. If you are using the Beck Depression Inventory, be sure to cite the reliability of that instrument. Why are you using the instrument that you will be using? They will want to know. Who are the participants that you are going to include in your study? Describe them in theoretical terms. If you have access to a large group of religiously active African Americans, for example, because your agency or you yourself have a close affiliation with some churches and you are doing your study on the effect of religious involvement on depression treatment, both theoretically describe your population, i.e. religiously active African Americans, and in concrete terms. The study participants will be recruited through a cooperative arrangement with St. Mark's, St. Luke's, and St. Vincent's churches, all of which have large and active African American populations. If you are using random sampling to get those people, you won't really need to justify that, but if you're using a snowballing sample, then you're going to need to address and justify why are you using that method to recruit participants. If I was a re reviewer on a proposal and I saw that you were going to recruit through these cooperative arrangements, I would have a very strong concern about a snowballing sample. However, if you were doing the same study but was with Hmong refugees <clears throat> and you are recruiting through regional Buddhist temples, I would fully understand it. Be sure to address any anticipated problems with your sampling and with your participants. If you are doing research on post-traumatic stress, for example, is there anything in your research protocol that may exacerbate symptoms? Then be sure to address that in your proposal. Also, if you are working with a historically difficult to research population or one that is very small subpopulation, address problems that may come up obtaining enough participants to do the research. If you have special access because of your status as a member of a small community, be sure to emphasize that status. A research proposal is simply an arrangement of details that tell the story of how you are going to answer a question. How are you going to actually collect the data? And be specific. If you are going to survey members of Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, provide some specific insight into exactly how you're going to distribute and collect the surveys. So if you are going to go to open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, announce to the group that you would like members to participate in a research project and that you will set up in the adjacent room with coffee and cake after the meeting, simply state that. Also state any concerns there may be about privacy in those recruitments, concerns about privacy when participants are filling out surveys, and practical concerns about how you're going to get that data back and in a useful manner. How are you going to analyze the data? If you know what kind of data you're going to collect, you will be able to tell the proposal review committee specifically what kind of analysis you will be able to do. Why are you doing the kind of analysis that you're doing? How does it meet the need to demonstrate the effectiveness of your intervention or answer the question you are proposing to answer? Schedule. Be realistic. If you think something is going to take two weeks to accomplish, allow yourself two months. 
Things just take longer than you might expect. If you are collecting a lot of qualitative data, don't pretend that you can analyze it quickly. Large foundations and government agencies that offer funding will have experts both in the field of study and in the methods used reviewing your study. They won't look at you as someone who is eager to do a job. They will look at you, look at your proposal and say, this person doesn't know what they're doing. One of the things that we haven't talked much about <coughs> uh, this year is the cost of doing research. When you are developing uh, a budget for your research, it is a good idea to get some technical assistance from someone who has done this before. But in any case, be reasonable. Going back to the, my little working group, they wanted to add money for everything in the budget. It doesn't work that way. Be reasonable and justify every expense and then add in a reasonable amount for overhead and your reviewers will look at your proposal and say it looks like these people know what they're doing. Almost any study that is produced under the auspices of any federal funding source that involves studying people will require an institutional review board approval. Institutional review boards will charge you to review your study even if they reject it. A good way to get around that is to partner with someone at the university. Find someone who is interested in your population area or has special skills in evaluation or analysis and write them in as a co-principal investigator. Since the IRBs will do reviews for university employees and faculty, you can circumvent some of those charges. However, you may also find yourself having to give over some of the overhead costs to the study of the study to the university. Biographical sketches and resumes are an important part of the research proposal. A funding agency will not accept your proposal without them. And then the IRB will not review them without your uh, bi bi biographical sketch, sketch, your resume <clears throat> or curriculum vita. If you are collaborating with any agency or, or in any way there needs to be um, a letter on agency, see the letterhead to attest to that. <clears throat> Evidence of feasibility means you need to demonstrate that you will be able to do the study, that you have the proper education, training, experience, and resources to carry the thing through. And finally, what plans do you have to disseminate the results? Where are you going to attempt to publish the results? Are you going to present it at conferences or workshops? Is it going to be published in the popular press or in news reports? Or all the above? Articulate that. Qualitative and quantitative study proposals are similar in many ways, including building a persuasive argument for the logic and value of the study. However, qualitative studies have some important distinctions. Some of the former difficulty in getting qualitative research proposals approved stem from the general newness of the qualitative reports. Now that qualitative methods are within the mainstream of research methods <clears throat> with the kind of populations and problems social work is dealing with, being able to speak research methods in a qualitative dialect will be an important part of getting your proposal accepted. Describe your plan using known methods address concerns about having an unstructured research process, and address your analysis methods specifically. A social work research report should com communicate what, your, what data you gathered and ideas that you are planning to contribute to the general body of scientific knowledge, and specifically any area you can stimulate and direct further inquiry. Writing reports include some general considerations, including the knowledge and perspective of the audience. Different language and emphasis may be necessary depending on who is reading your proposal or report. 
Other social workers may be familiar with terms related to the profession, but more general audiences may not. Researchers will understand technical concepts, but practitioners and administrators may not. If you are submitting a manuscript to a journal, the content should match the purview of the journal. Some journals are more or less practice oriented. Others are more or less research oriented. Resources such as the National Association of Social Workers Authors Guide might provide helpful information about journals related to social work. Research notes are brief and concise, ranging from one to five pages. It should inform the reader why the brief note is justified and describe the finding. Reports for research sponsors vary in length and detail and should reflect the requirement and interests of the sponsor. Working papers are tentative presentations with an implicit request for comments. Professional papers are often similar to working papers in that comments are often solicited. Articles are probably the most popular research reports and are roughly 20 to 25 pages in length. Books are the lengthiest and the most detailed form of research reports. Just like research projects, research reports have different purposes. That may include <clears throat> on all or any of the following exploration, description, or explanation. Just like in college, play, plagiarism is a problem when you are in your professional life. You can lose your job if you plagiarize. You can lose your professional license if you plagiarize. And you can certainly lose your reputation in standing in a professional community. So don't do it. And remember, plagiarism is more than just using quotation marks and citing author names and page numbers. If, if you paraphrase, give credit. If you have any kind of idea that you know came as a result of someone else's work, then you are obliged by social work ethics and the general laws that surround copyright to attribute that idea to the proper person. We can all read this on this slide. You probably should have put specific and concise in all capitalized letters. It is important. Going through this list on the slide again, the only thing that I will add to this list is succinct. Succinct writing. Say what you're going to say and then move to the next important detail, detail and say it. If you can reduce your report size in any way by, by representing any of your information, particularly about your population in a tabular format, do it. The results of your report, sometimes called the findings, need to be presented in enough detail that someone else could do the study and replicate it. If you are writing a qualitative research report, be sure to include sufficient evidence based on the rich descriptive presentation of the participant's own words that the reader will be able to feel as though your analysis makes good sense. Limit your interpretations to your findings. Don't interject your personal, political, religious, or other beliefs. There's <clears throat> no section of the research report called editorial. So don't try to slip it in there anywhere. One way of keeping a research report a little shorter is to combine your findings and discussion into one section. I personally like that approach. However, I've discovered that it is often not the case that reviewers want to see the results and the I have discovered that it is often the case that reviewers want to see the results and the discussion separated into different sections. I find it much easier to merge discussions and conclusions into a single section, but readability is always enhanced when you keep these sections separate. Again, keep your editorial and personal opinions out of the report, even in the conclusions 
stage. Forget everything you may have learned in some undergraduate or high school debate-oriented writing class. You are writing as a scientist here. You are projecting objectivity here. You are trying to convey the truth based on the best evidence, not, not an argument or not, win, not to win an argument or advance your personal agenda. Research reports often require a list of references. Certainly, if they are going to be offered for publication in a journal, they will. But also, if you give a report to a funding agency, they will want to know what references you have included. Any appendix? Usually, journal articles are not interested in them. But that is changing. With more and more journals being online exclusively, they are allowing authors to upload a variety of things that they would never that they would never have included in articles before. Again, qualitative reports are different than quantitative studies. How are they? Well, they tend to follow the same format. However, they tend to follow the same format or at least to be on the safe side, they can follow the same format. They often require footnotes depending on your journal or where you plan on disseminating your information. You can offer those. They are almost always longer due to the necessity of including the rich description of the qualitative data, the long quotes from your respondents and participants. Qualitative research reports are also much more amenable to creative writers. Finding a way to present qualitative data in a way that is as engaging as a short story will broaden the dissemination of your report to a wider audience. Thank you.